All right, we're live. All right, live. Yeah, we're Welcome live. to I Ask No One, I Ask Someone. I am here at the Student Chow's in downtown Buffalo with one and only Johnny Chow. Johnny Chow. Chow. Dude, thanks a lot for joining me. No doubt. No doubt. I appreciate it. The basis of Stone Sour, owner of the Student Chow's here. I just want to say uh, cheers for bringing the first ever parkade and Noodle House to Buffalo, New York. I know. You got the Bills flag out there, so let's oh, yeah. go Buffalo. Thanks a lot. Let's go Buffalo. Cheers. Right. So, Mr. the Chows, and your name, Johnny Chow, and I, I don't know where the Chow came from, but Johnny's real name is John Mark Bechtel. That's that right. Okay, so where did the Chow come from? Nickname I got when I was, man, I don't know, mid teens, and just kind of stuck. It just turned into like Johnny Chow Chow. And it turned into Johnny Chow. And it turned into Chow. Chow, like you just like to eat food? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And uh, then I moved to New York City when I was about like 20, 21, and uh, tried to get rid of that nickname when I was in New York. <laughs> And then all uh, my friends from Buffalo started moving to New York and started calling me Chow. And then all my New York friends were like, what the hell is this Chow thing? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of come get rid of me. Well, you opened up in the suit at Chow's uh, about, was it three, four years ago? Uh, actually, this past July was two years. Two years, okay. Yeah, two years. Two years. Two years. And opening a place like this, what was your... Was uh, your inspiration to do something like this? Have you always worked in the restaurant business? Yeah. When I was when I was 15 years old, my uncle on my, my 15th birthday, my uncle Mike called me down to uh, this bar that he had just opened up. Call me on Hey, happy birthday! I'm down in the bar. I got your present. I'm a couple blocks away from where I lived, and uh, I go tearing down there, and I'm like, oh my god, what all can I get me? You know, a sweatshirt, a pair of kicks. And I walk in, and he says, hey, happy birthday. He threw an apron in my face. He said, happy birthday. I got you a job. And I get back and start washing dishes. I was like, sucks. You know what I mean? At 15, having to work. But, you know, I worked out a, you know, three, four days out of that week. And I was off the books because I was too young. And um, he comes up, he hands me a little envelope. He says, uh, here's your first paycheck. And it was like 84 bucks or something. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, you know, that much money at 15. And you know, I was like, this is awesome, man. Throw on my headphones, listen to music, and just watch dishes. And then I subsequently worked throughout the kitchen, gave a prep cook, and you know, got on the line. And then uh, one night, uh, one early evening, I should say, uh, after I worked a shift, um, the kitchen was like, listen, he's like, you know, Johnny, you know, call called it. You can't bar back to him, so I need to bar back to him. I don't want to borrow that. He's like, okay, it's, it's the easiest job. All you got to do is make sure that we have clean glasses, ice pens are filled, beer coolers are filled, and liquor on the shelf. And, you know, that night I walked out with like over 100 bucks cash in there. One night. And I like do, you know, four or five nights and I, you know, make a little bit more than that. This is way better. So that got me behind the bar, out of the kitchen. And ever since then, I've been mean, way towards bartending, managing bars, and uh, Opened up a bunch of places for friends and had finally decided to do Sue Challenge with my, uh, my partner in life and partner in business. Christy. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, Christy. Yeah, Johnny, again, I'm here. Johnny Chow from Stone Sour, owner of Masuda Chow's. Uh, you are born and raised in Buffalo. You are wearing Bill shirts on stage, you know, hats, yes. hats yeah. and, you know, in these, these promo pictures. I just love seeing that. Yeah, but, sure. uh, same with Masuda a little bit. You mentioned last time we spoke, you have a magician, a magician coming through yeah. weekly. He, he comes here when he's in town. This guy, Garrett Thomas, he works with David Blaine, so he's out of town a lot working with David Blaine, uh, writing new skits and whatnot, tricks. Um, he'll come in, he'll just randomly kind of come in, like, you know, and just magic people's faces off. Like, people get so tricked out about it. Like, I love when there's a big kind of tough early guys in there. And he goes up and he starts off with his Rubik's Cube tricks. Okay. This guy's like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. And then like kind of two or three tricks into it, these guys are like, what are some other tricks that he's just pulling out of his sleeve? I mean, you know, he's got this magic eight ball 
that is straight up a hard, rock hard eight ball. Yeah. And he puts it in his wallet. It's like it's crazy. It's an amazing slam. Wow. You know, illusion, so to say. And he's got he's got a million tricks. Literally. I'll I'll post a link to his content. I'm sure he's got a website. Yeah, oh, he does. And actually, YouTube video. literally just won Penn and Teller Penn's at uh, Full Lux and Penn and Teller Full Lux show. And he just was on that and won, actually. So, Sweet. Yeah, we just did a little uh, viewing, you know, screening of the debut of it. We filmed it back in March, but it just aired two days ago. I'll post a link down in the description for him. And uh, my favorite, personally, my favorite. Uh, memory that I've had here in the suit of Chow's is the Metallica pre-party. Metallica came and played in Buffalo in 2018, and the night before, all of my friends from around the world, you, Charlie, and everyone else joined here, walking into this door with a Bill's flag waving right above, <laughs> and I, that was just so special, and you know, it's, me and Ashton had a great dinner here the other night. Um, beef and broccoli is I mean, one of the best fried rice. You want some good fried rice? Oh, so I had a, a ramen and Ashton had fried rice, but the staff still remembers that Metallica night before yeah. I came to town. That was awesome. Remember that picture we had in front of the Sun Yeah. Like yeah. There was at least 50, 60 people in that picture. It's, like, it was nuts. It's so special. I had a black ticket, so I was traveling from pretty much city to city. I did that seven or eight times between 2018 and 19. So when it came through Buffalo, here's the inner night beers that everyone's drinking. And just repping Buffalo, New York, you know, and that was really, really special. Yeah, man, so thinking about that shit. And we had the Black and Whiskey. We had a Black and Whiskey and an Edge Night shop here at Scotch That was really cool. That was a lot of fun. And on top of that, did we not have, was that the same way we had the Metallica? I think we possibly probably had that Metallica pinball night. Metallica pinball night? Yeah. Unless that was a different night when it was the Grover. Okay. Yeah, but either way, man, we've done a few Metallica events here, but that was the best one. Sure. Yeah, come on over. You want to play some games and contact some really good local beers anytime you're in Buffalo? Come on through. Um, but real quick, I just want to start with the fact of the day. At the beginning of IS No One, in these episodes, I'd like to bring up what happened today, on October 21st, in music history. And I've got my resources, and there's one really cool thing that happened on this date in 1978. You know the band, The Police? Of course. Okay, The Police from the UK, they made their U.S. debut tonight in 1978. Uh, they got here from the UK with just their instruments in their cases on a plane, and that's it. They show up at CBGB's that's in awesome. New York. Have you ever played CBGB's? I don't even know if it's still in existence. It's it's well, it is not in existence. Okay. okay. It's, uh, it's actually owned by NYU. Oh, NYU. Yeah, I played there quite a few times. I'm fortunate enough to do that. Yeah. So a lot of amazing shows there. And what's cool about CBs, it was just such a dump. I mean, like you could be standing next to you could be standing next to each other, and I'd be like a half a foot tall because of the layers of floor that had peeled away throughout the years. Huh. And there's just stickers everywhere, this famous bathroom. Go down the stairs uh, to the bathrooms and the men's room had no door on it and there was just cement like lock. That this shitter was on. <laughs> I'm not allowed to swear. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's fine. There's a shitter on. I'm not watching, it's okay. Oh, okay. So right. the throne is just there with no stall doors or anything. So if you, if you literally had two days of shit, you were sitting there, well, hey, how you doing, man? I see you're taking a piss in the air. Yeah, that's the air it's, it's a pretty ridiculous the place to dump, but it had an amazing sound system and a lot of history. A lot of history of punk rock and a lot of my favorite rockers, just in general, Duff McGagan being one of them, likes to still wear the CBGB shirt. Yeah. And uh, did you have any kind of, I mean, for the police to come over here with their instruments for the first time playing in a plane, both play CBGBs, right. do you have any punk rock moments that you've had over the years in your band, something just impromptu or just really kind of fun like that? You know, I, I guess, so when I first moved to New York City, I hooked up with this guy, Gavin Ben Black, um, who's a big well known punk rock artist in New York City. And uh, we had this band called Pry, PRY. Yeah. And uh, we were playing at a place called it was a bar that was just a, normally a regular bar. They would put on shows once in a while. It wasn't set up for it at all. Mm. Um, but we played the show, and John Joseph from Chromex. Uh, Chromex was a huge hardcore band that 
really influenced me a lot. Sure. That's why like the punk rock was really starting to get heavy. Not necessarily metal heavy, but started really started to really get down to those shoves and like and he didn't drop to it. Um, this wasn't a big thing back then. So he was on the side, he was watching watching us play and come off stage and smash my forearm and say, Yo, kid, that's a pop my forearms. <laughs> and I'm just like tripped out because like that's John Joseph. Compliment, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I don't know. It, was, it, was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. Well, that's this punk rock right there. Bro. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Nice forearm. <laughs> I Sweet. got to see some of the Beastie Boys perform with Pro Max actually at CDJ. Yeah, when they came sure. out, oh, God, man. Oh, 80s, 90s? Or? We're talking, I'd say, early, mid 90s, something like that. Uh, we just knew where that show just came out and just did a song again. So I couldn't even tell you what song it was. Sir. Well, I didn't know you lived in New York. I had to wear St. Vitus yeah, there you uh, go. shirt. You know, nice. you guys had fun times in there. I saw a band there called Albatross. Yeah. Albatross? I know that name. Okay. Yep. Yeah, they had, they had a Mastodon beers there and just a lot of you know, satanic things. It was just cool to be in there. But, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, also, Tom Petty, he would have turned 70 today. So happy birthday, Tom Petty, RIP. I know Petty used to come through Daring Lake a lot. Uh, yeah. Did you ever see Tom Petty live? No, I never saw him live. Him? Never met him. Um, I have a friend who somehow his girlfriend or like direct cousins with the Petties. Um, it's the closest I've got to him. But like okay. an amazing DVD documentary. I've seen it through it's really long. Really long, but it's awesome. Really? And it shows like. What's it called? I saw it like, about like, 15, 18 years ago. Okay. But it showed like. Old man, he started out as a band. He continued on as a band. All those musicians stayed in the long term. Yeah, one of the great American uh, musicians. Next to you, right? <laughs> nah. Thanks again for joining, nah, man. Nah, we got Johnny Chow here of Stone Sour bassist, Grammy nominated Stone Sour, also owner of Monsieur de Chow's downtown Buffalo. Snoop Dogg's also turning 49 today. Oh, shit. Snoop Dogg, you that guy in the Corona commercials. I mean, he's still, he just stays relevant since the 90s, you know? No, he's definitely a great himself. Right. So, uh, today's quote, I like to have a quote of the day. So, today's quote, I had to, you know, I was thinking, what am I going to say with Johnny here? And I just got to say, nobody circles the wagon like the <laughs> Buffalo Bills. <laughs> yes. That's <laughs> perfect. Yep, yeah, I love when, yeah. love when Jim Kelly says it too. Yeah. But, you know, we started off 4 0. We uh, we dropped one against the Titans. They're looking good. Dropped another one against the, the World Champion Chiefs. We were kind of in it, though. Yep. So, go Bills. We got the Jets, the Patriots, and, you know, we're, we got we to gotta bring it back, yeah. man. So, you play the bass guitar. Why the bass? And, and what was your biggest inspiration to put the bass in your hand? Well, to be honest, man, there was no big inspiration for me to put the bass in my hands. So it, was, it was a weird thing where it was all thrown at you like the apron that your dad had. <laughs> no, it was uh, so my neighbor, Bobby Moynihan, he's got a drum kit. And another friend, Mike Carino, his dad had a few guitars and a few different amps. So we would go over to Bobby's basement and Mike would bring his amps and his guitars. And I actually garbage picked a. Uh, 535 model body guitar that had the low four strings on it, two high strings on it, and these were flat mount strings on it too. Um, so, you know, I bring it over, I'm like, dude, I can play guitar with you guys. And Mike said, no, dude, there's only four strings on there, check this out. And he plugs me in to this other amp, turns the treble all the way down, puts the bass all the way up. He's like, dude, just play along single note, like, just single notes, just play along with me. And you'll be the basis. And I'm like, huh, really? So, yeah, dude, trust me. And then that just kind of took it from there. It's like, you know, I don't expect that kind of thing. Sure. I always enjoyed, you know, playing music when I was younger like that. Never took it seriously until we started doing that. We just do like Suicidal Tennessee's covers, Misfits covers, stuff like that. And Metallica. Not, that, not at that time, no. That was a little too complicated for us. Yeah, you know I mean, we were just funky, kind of get in, get out, yeah. go fast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, um, over the years, you know, we, we didn't really have a band or anything. Over the years, I got more and more into the hardcore scene and Fred's band, like Zero Tolerance, an old uh, legendary hardcore band from Buffalo, 
those towns um, definitely led the way for a lot of bands, hardcore bands in Buffalo. Um, so I played on and off with them throughout the years, and then uh, eventually moved to uh, NYC. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then uh, from there, Los Angeles. And now I'm back in Buffalo about 10, 11 years. So. Nice Good stuff. Man. Yeah. Rock and roll, man. Sure. Do you like Cliff Burton? Of Cliff course. Burton? I mean, oh, how can you not like Cliff Burton? I know. Talk, right? Right? Yeah, that, he was such a badass. And just had so much style in his playing. And even, you know, you listen to like Injustice for All, where's the bass? You know, maybe you know, Lars admitted he buried the bass on purpose because it was like, you know, nobody can replace Cliff. Um, but even before that, on the other albums, I feel like if Cliff would have been a little bit more out there, that much bigger of a band. Right? Yeah. And just his playing is really incredible, man. He's just got such a style on it. You know, when I was getting ready for this morning, for today's interview, um, I was listening to your Meanwhile in Burbank EP. Yeah. Covers EP with Stone Sour, they covered Creeping Death. And uh, man, there's little nuances in that song. I listen to the song thousands of times, right? But there's little things that you play that is totally something that Cliff would do, little jammy sections. Well, I'll tell you what, man. When we do these covers, if there's somebody who I greatly respect and appreciate, man, uh, which the person is one of them, you know, I, I'm not going to try to like do my own little thing on it. I want to definitely have it be exactly what you did. And then when I'm getting into listening to a song, I really like get the headphones on, I'm just like over and over I'm listening to the song. And I'll even put it on mode, though. Sometimes, to me, Lines jump out more when it's a wider kind of setting yeah. rather than having to be loud and everything's in the face. And um, man, I just, I'm like, oh, shit. I never realized that there was this little bass on in here. I never realized this or that. And so, you know, I just really tried to, I picked up and did exactly what he did. R.I.P. the major rager on the four string motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I clip them all, all the way. How how do you can you guys hear us a little better? I know Ashton said it was a little quiet earlier. Thumbs up, whatever. The f okay. Well, just real quick, my buddy Blake, firefighter in Minneapolis, Minnesota, you know, a new new dad. Uh, he's asking, what is our are you four eighty six? What is what does that mean? It's a track it's, off of a Stone Sour song. To be honest, it's an abortion pill. Are you four eighty six? There you go, Blake. You hear that? All right. Uh, so Ryan, my twin brother, he's in Athens, Greece, and he and I had a chat last night, and I didn't know that he met you while you were bartending at Allentown Burger Venture. Yeah, Allen Burger Venture. I never knew that you worked at ABV, and the way he met you was kind of funny. You had a Hellfest shirt on. Hellfest is a, is a big, big metal festival in Clisson, France. Awesome. And uh, one of the best festivals in, in, in the world right there. And uh, Ryan asked if he's ever been there. And you're like, no, I actually played it. Yeah. I mean, how was it to play Hellfest? Was this a Stone Sour or was it Cavalier? First, first time I played Hellfest was with Cavalier Conspiracy. And then I played it again with Soulfly. And then a few times with Cavalier Conspiracy and then a few times with Stone Sour as well. And, I mean, it's incredible, man. When you walk out on that stage and you... Can't see the end of heads where there's like you know seven five thousand people. Dude, what's going through your mind there? I mean, you, you just go into a mode. You're, you just I don't know. You get so amped and so energized. It's just like before you know it, shows up. You know what I mean? And it's just, all adrenaline. Oh, it's it, it, it's really awesome that you're in that band that people really want to see. Like that that first year we did Capital Art Conspiracy, that was '08, and we. Did a lot of the direct support slots and stuff because it was a big coming back together of Max and Igor Cavalera. Seems like Max left several Terry years ago. So, I mean, that was huge, man. We were doing like direct support slots. So, a lot of the people out there were like, oh my God, this is the first time, the closest thing I've ever seen to seeing Sepultura. Yeah. I know a lot of people haven't seen Sepultura. Right. Yeah, but, you know, it was huge, man. So, when you have that, like, you know, that energy, First show I ever played with Cavalier Conspiracy was an electric weekend festival in Madrid, Spain. And we had a two hour rehearsal before we actually played. That was it. And there was like, I think, 50,000 people there. Really? And when we played Roots, it was so crazy. People, waves of people, like, of them jumping up and down there, just like, 
You're not even playing. You're just like, just like I'm looking at this guy, <laughs> like banging my head, and I look back at Eddie B, my my tech at the time. He's like, yeah, it's not. This is what it's about. And I was just like, oh my god. I, <laughs> I mean, everybody was just became off stage. Like, wow, what the just happened? Johnny, of course, is currently based in Stone Sour, but he used to play with uh, Cavalier Conspiracy between the years 2008-2012. About the, yeah, about 12, yeah, because I remember about, I think, 13, 12, 13 is when I popped in with Stone Sour. Okay, got it. And then we were doing so much playing. It just was something like, yeah, awesome ball and so on. Um, but Cavalier Conspiracy, that's a band with Max and Igor Cavalera. They're from Brazil. And they really pushed metal into the 90s with a band called Sepultura. They were around in the 80s, but really it was them and Pantera and Rage yeah. Against the Machine bringing the heaviness still, while grunge and, and I love that shit, but you know, with metal, Sepultura really waving that flag. You know, angry music, you know, heavy music, music that had a lot of substance and purpose, and a uh, band that sounded kind of like corn, you know, corn was just bringing that heaviness. So, Seeing you uh, that you were playing with them, I'm a diehard Gojira fan. Oh, yeah. Those guys are actually, I would say, my friends. Yeah, uh, I've seen them around the world from Australia to Vancouver to LA. To when they see me and Ryan, we're the twins up front, yeah, just like awesome. myself and so on. Right, right. But Joe Duplantier, he yeah. uh, to this day, he still talks with Taylor about how stoked he was that he was able to lay bass yeah. down on uh, Cavalier Conspiracy Records. He was such a big Chaos AD fan and first John Ventura fan. Yeah, I mean, what do the guys say about that experience? Have you met Joe and talked yeah, about this no, at all? I know or? Joe well. I know Joe well. I know Mario. Yeah. Um, Happy belated birthday to Joe. Yeah, it's BD. Um, cool guy, great guy. Um, you know, just an awesome musician. Chill, down to earth. And, uh, you know, he was he was like, to be part of that because he's up to earth, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was, when I got that call too, I was like, whoa, no way. You know, it's, like, it's crazy. A friend of mine was a book manager. In New York City was uh, Soulfly's agent. Okay, so he was going to be booking the Cavalier Conspiracy tours. And Joe couldn't do the tours because Joe was obviously with Gojira. So um, he called me up and said, Hey, dude, you interested in this? Hell like, oh, yeah. So it was an easy thing. By the way, do you want to just go, you know, want to join Cavalier Conspiracy? Uh, what do you think? Yes, no? <laughs> I know, right? Just like that, it was just like it was. Well, it was just like, well, I'm gonna put you in touch with Gloria, the manager, and I talked to Gloria on the phone. She put Max on the phone. Um, I knew Mark Rizzo, the guitarist of Soulfly and Cavalier Conspiracy, when I lived in New York City. He lived in Jersey, I was living in Jersey City, which is just like living in you know, Brooklyn, Queens. It's just you know, cheaper, cheaper rent across the across the water. Oh, gotcha. Um, so we actually played in a band together for a hot minute. Like literally had like three rehearsals and then he got the soul flight. So I knew Rizzo and I called him Mark. I'm like, Mark, why don't you tell me about the fireball ministry? I didn't think you'd want to, you know, leave that band. I'm like, well, dude, come on, this is Cavalier's music. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it was just, you know, Mark vouched for me. And next thing you know, I'm going to get the plane that I get to see me and come back to this year. Of all, of all the, the music that we'd be playing uh, for the first leg of the tour. Just and, learned it. Uh, yep, just learned that and went out to Madrid, Spain, got in the rehearsal room for like two hours the day before, and then played the next day. My dream, uh, my dream for the longest time has always been to be a touring musician, right? Um, I'm a drummer. I don't want to play the drums every day. So right there, that's my answer. I should not be pursuing it. And you should pursue it only if it's really a thing that you feel and it, it's such a commitment. You it, know? it is. It is. A lot of people think, oh, my God, you get to see the world, man. You get to do all this cool shit and all this stuff. Not so much. There are times and, and opportunities where we might have, like, two or three days off in a really kick-ass city. But that a lot of it is, like, just go travel, go, go, go. Fly in, play. Next morning, you fly out. You know, the bus is there. You drive in that day. Play the show, leave that night, you know. So, it's just one of those things where it's not, it becomes a job. It definitely has become a job. You know, 4 a.m. lobby call for a 6 a.m. flight. And uh, get off that flight, go right to the venue, play your show, go to the hotel at like 2 in the morning, 
goes in reverse again, all, all over again. I mean, you know, four in and get up to another fight. But you know what? It's worth it 100%. And I get to do what I love doing. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's an incredible job to have. I'm very fortunate to be where I'm at. I want to continue on that real quick. I'm here with Johnny Chow, Stone Sour, Basis, and uh, Ryan's joining from Athens. Ryan can't stop smiling. So ah, say what's up, Ryan? Ryan? How you doing, brother? I'm going to dedicate this one to you, Ryan. Hey, Ryan, cheers, man. Keep rocking Athens, Greece, dude. Nice. <laughs> so, talk about the fortunate times you get once in a while. We did have, when I was in Cavalier Conspiracy, yep. we had a three day off period. In Athens, and went out just exploring, saw some amazing stuff. So you do have those opportunities once in a while, like I said. Sure. So this last kind of uh, Stone Sour tour, uh, Japan being my favorite country, and Tokyo being my favorite city in the world, we just got done doing an Australian tour and flew straight to Japan. Had like three and a half days off, and then two nights in Tokyo. So I was there for like. You know, Five, six days. That was amazing. Met ramen every night, sushi every night. Yeah. So Did you go to some like weird music club or some funky thing that's only in Tokyo, Japan? Yeah, I mean it's not only a music club, but I guess it is. Yeah, it could karaoke. Be. It's, it's called uh, it's called Robot Bar. Robot and, Bar in Tokyo. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's like all about these robots and these dancers and these crazy songs they have and shooting like, lasers and sparks flying everywhere at each other. It's it was a trip. You can look it up. It's very, very famous. I was first introduced to the weirdness, the coolness, the lights of Tokyo in a, in a game called Tony Hawk Core Skater 3. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, dude? No, yeah. not sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, with, tour, with touring, I, uh, I mean, if you could just ed educate our viewers a little bit more, just the travel part and, you know, there's unwritten rules, too, on a tour bus or on a plane or whatever, where you're going from town to town, what I've heard is... You never want to take a shit in the bus. No least. number two on the bus. Number no number two on the bus. <laughs> Are there any? Is there anything else? You know, well, I mean, stopping for at gas stops and, and throughways and yeah, you know, it's just you know no just, sleep. And I'll tell you, it's all small. It's it's a respect thing. You got to be very selfless. You know what I mean? You have twelve people living on the bus, and you know think about that. Twelve people on the bus. You have a back lounge. You have a front lounge, and you know, when you're doing these day drives, you have a long haul sometimes. You're doing the day drives where it's not just overnight. You know, everybody's kind of up. Some people are in the bus, some in the back lounge, some in the front lounge. You just have to be respectful of everybody's space. And food. You don't want to eat anybody else's food. You don't want to eat anybody's <laughs> leftovers. You know, that's, that's one thing you know, always get that Sharpie, you're right, this is yours. You know, your name on it, so you know, everybody respects that. So, great. Corey Taylor is the lead singer of Slipknot, uh, one of my personal favorite guys, and we'll get into, into him later. But does he have anything that uh, he's got certain preferences on a, on a bus if you care to share? Just... No, man. I mean, we all have our like preferences. It's just like, oh, I call this one, I call that one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, just respect them. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just it's being respectful of everybody, and you know, so like, you know, everybody's got weird habits and stuff like that. It is what it is. Gotcha. It's like you're married to these people, literally married to these people. And uh, but it's fun, man. It's it's, it's not sour. We just like we all get along so well. That's like that helps. There's no there's no like, annoying moments. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where you know I, I don't I don't know how to describe it. It's just, I got we're, we're just all great friends, and we all just get along so well. So it makes everything that much easier. And the fact that the last tour cycle we. Did a band bus and a crew bus, and so obviously there's a lot less band. So it's basically the band and like Juan who would be uh, security recording, and you know. So we did have a lot of space. Gotcha. A lot of jokes, a lot of funny times. A lot of jokes, I'm sure. A lot of late night music nights where everybody's you know hanging out, playing their their song, half an hour of music. And, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's it's a fun part. That's so cool, man. I mean, really one of the funniest guys in rock and roll uh, that I've met. And he's also from upstate New York. And shit, I'd consider him a friend, too. Anytime he's in town, it brings Wagles Hot Dogs and, and Jenny Females. So, and I think you know where I'm going. It's Ron Daler. Yeah. I was in their high road music video. That was his kind of uh, 
plot for the High Road music video. I'll post it in the, that in the description below. But funny guys that you've come across, Ron Daler, uh, any moments from him, like what's the, you know, the hardest time you ever laughed with Corey Taylor or uh, he's a goofball. He writes these books and I read these books. I've, I've met at Book Soup in West Hollywood with Randy Blythe. I, I, you know, I couldn't even pick out a particular time because yeah. it's like the whole day. I mean, Corey's like a little kid. He's just like always joking around. He's always like, you know, we were, we would do some songs that we would like change the lyrics around to, um, to like whatever funny kind of moments we were going through. And uh, which I won't say, or say what the lyrics are, but you know, we just, uh, he's, 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 he's a trip. He's a lot of fun. And he likes to call us on that stage. Like, like if you fuck something up, we will definitely call you out. Yeah. Um, what the fuck, man? Yeah, yeah. Which is which is hilarious because it's like I remember the first tour I did with them on the House of Old Bones, uh, part one, or part two. Right now. My name is Alan. Yeah, great song, great song. Um, but we uh, we did the we did this short little run. So I had to learn all this music. Did this short run called the Bacchanalia Festival in South America. And, um, Brazil, um, Mexico, all throughout Mexico a few days. But so we did that. It was like a week and a half, two week run. Then we came home and we had like two weeks off before we hit the road again. And when I'm learning music, I can learn it pretty fast, but if I don't stay on top of it, I'll lose it pretty fast. So I'm always learning music for like Cavalier Whispers, so, you know, Soul Five, Stone Sour, you know, Fireball, and I'm learning all this music all the time. So it's like, you know, I can learn it quickly, but I can lose it if I don't stay on top of it. Right. So that two weeks off that we had home, what it was, but I was, I think we were in the middle of a move or something like that for family, and there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff I was doing at the house to get ready to get, like, head out and go for the next like, two years, basically. So we get back to, to France. The first day, uh, we were playing, what were we playing? It wasn't Bataclan. Um, Bataclan? Yeah. Right. Few was the victims there. Um, I forget which, which venue it was in Paris, but uh, we... Um, we're up on stage and we're into it and we do the first song and then I'm like, oh shit, drawn a blank. I'm looking at the next song in mind. But I'm wait a minute. Why does this song start? <laughs> I'm like, yo, Roy. Like I'm back by the drums by the drum. I'm like, Roy, like, Roy. He turns up like, what? I'm like, yo, how, how does this song begin? He's like, what? I'm like, how does this song start? He's like, I started one, two, three. Oh, I know, but I Mouth it out to me. He was like, da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. I'm like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> and then, you know, click right into it. And then <laughs> we get to the third song or whatever, the break. And then we get to the next one. I'm like, yeah, I have to have a total fucking mind fart on stage right now. I'm like, boy, boy, this loud on there. We have our inners in and Roy's deaf as hell as it is. And he turned like, what? I'm like, dude. No, don't leave me hanging. How does the song start, dude? And then all certain chords are like, what the fuck is going on <laughs> back here? As Corey's talking. He's like, what the fuck is going on, on back here? Yeah, on the mic. He's like, the, the voice, hey, you, you know, can't remember how the songs begin. And Corey looks over like, Johnny Shaw, didn't we just get off and do in two weeks? It's the same set. I'm like, I know. I can get a little mind fart. He's like, okay. Well, if you want, I can hum out the songs to you on the mic before we begin it. Did you say this on the mic? Oh, yeah, so, yeah that's a, it was hilarious. Oh, my it was God. great. Everybody yeah. was good. like, that's how we, we all joke around with each other like that. That's we cool. play jokes on, on Corey on stage. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, called him out, like, even on, like, you know, birthdays, which he hates when we do that. And we made this whole little, I don't know if you, like, the beginning part of, um, of uh, the beginning of the last album, it was the type A, uh, type A. Yep. So basically, we had this guy, Sanka. Uh, awesome record, by the way. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, Ponzi Cervarelli, I think you could call them. Or Sergei Ponzarelli. Sergei Ponzarelli. And it was just a mashup of all different languages. And what Roy would do when do this invitation, he was like, hello, this is Sergei Ponzarelli. And we're here to wish Corey Taylor. Like, he did this whole crazy, like, recording and trick in, 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 in between the songs. Of course, like, <laughs> What? And then Josh comes out with the birthday cake and covered him in sparkles. And, you know, shit like that. We like to have fun. Another time, Josh, in between, in between our, our regular set and our encore set, Josh goes out and takes this really small, tiny, fine uh, 
um, uh, like sparkles. Puts it, like bags of it. Puts it all over Roy's room. Roy's <laughs> behind the curtain, not even seeing it. When we go in and play the song, the lights are down. When we come back on stage, then we go in and play a song. And Roy just kicks it in and he's playing. He's little noticing it on his big floor tops. All this glitter and it's like, <laughs> Oh, and he knows he's got to go into this part where he goes right to the tom, and all of a sudden, boom, <laughs> sparkles went up. He was covered, he was sweaty. He was like, honestly, man, he was cleaning out sparkles from the trunk that whole like, that whole time. That's, That's hilarious, time. man. That's hilarious. But yeah, hilarious. we like to have fun. Yeah, uh, I've been up close with Corey. Uh, there's a few times that come out to me. Uh, Metal Allegiance played a show after Lemmy passed. Uh, at the at the Whiskey a Go Go to commemorate Lemmy, played Running with the Devil, R.I.P. Eddie Van Halen, um, and yeah, Corey he came out and played. Jeez, uh, what song was it? Oh, God. Uh, Ace of Spades, maybe. Uh, but he was, had a shirt off and he was yeah. just having a good time. Like, oh, that's Corey Taylor. And then of course when they Slipknot headlined Gojira in Volvi, I think it was Behemoth. Um, the sound, like earlier in this episode, the sound was a little low. And there was this guy to my left, and he writes on his, on his phone, blows, gets the brightness up, and he says, we can't hear you. And Corey, in the middle of a song, kind of looks at this, and the guy puts it away, and Corey is in the middle of the song. He's like, no, 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 I want to see it again. So he, he saw it, and then that, uh, when the song finished, he went to the side of the stage, and all of a sudden the sound better. Just the, the improvisation yeah. and, and the looseness and, the, and the, I think if we were to have a captain in hard rock heavy metal on the ice, if just a captain in general, hockey, I think Corey really, I love my head field, but Corey really, really uh, represents us well. It's really it's, it's vocal about how awesome this underground music, it's now underground again, yeah. is. You know, yeah. you know, for sure. so, killer. So you open for Ozzy Osbourne. Did. Yeah. And when that when the opener was announced for Ozzy Osbourne and there's no more tours and uh, no more tours too, no more tours too, because hey, we're not enough. talking '91. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Too. But we're talking 2018. Uh, I drove out to Syracuse with two of my bandmates I used to jam with in San Diego, and we were on the lawn and I was about to see Ozzy Osbourne for my very first time. I'm really excited about that. But Stone Sour, I caught the ass end of your set when you opened up for I think Godsmack and. Uh, and stains one year. I think this is before. Might have been before I was there. Okay, uh, but dude, opening for Ozzy Osbourne for for amphitheaters in the summer. Yeah. How cool is that? Do you have any funny moments from Ozzy Osbourne, the one and the only? Uh, you know, I mean, not necessarily. Ozzy wasn't around much as far as like he was basically. They were hugged wherever we were. If we were in a region like if we played like Syracuse, they'd be hugged out in uh, New York City. So they would fly every day. In and out of his short uh, um, So he wasn't around much. Um, he did send us a killer like gift basket, right? It was awesome. What like, was in the gift basket? Like everything from like cheeses and nuts and chocolates and a bottle of vodka and a bottle of whiskey, and, you know, a couple of bottles of wine. Like, he's super nice that, that he did that. Um, Zach, Zach Wild would hang out. He would hang out. He's, yeah. a, he's a trip. He's, He's of course guy. sober, but Zach Wild is still. You talk about funny musicians. Yeah, I'm sure he was. Oh, he was a trip, man. He would always try to try to get us to these it's within where like I, I played the tour manager, and he comes into Stone Sour's dressing room, and I had to be the tour manager to get him out of there because Stone Sour was sick of him hanging out in the room, like stupid stuff like that. Like he would really like no 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 okay this is what you got to say he played it out. Okay, here, here's here's what you're gonna say, and then Corey, you'll be over here, and then I'll be in here, and then I'm just going in your fridge, eating, eating your food, you know, from the dressing room. And you guys are just like so annoyed with me. Call in Johnny Chow as a, as a, you know tour manager, my tour manager, and try to get me out of here and stuff. I don't know. It was just it was he was fun. He was fun. Zach Wild lead guitar uh, of Ozzy Osbourne. I mean, there was Gus G from Greece who was with Ozzy for a few years, but. After the one and only Randy Rhodes passed away, yeah. you know, God bless him. I think that was in '83 or '84. So, um, uh, on my way here, Diary of a Madman came on Ozzy nice. Boneyard, nice. and I thought of Randy Rhodes, and I thought of you know Eddie Van Halen, these big guitar gods. 
And even though I don't know every single lick of Black Label Society and what Zach Wilde has done with Ozzy, I don't own the No Rush for the Wicked record still. Uh, I do love No More Tears record. I think No yeah. More Tears, that song, We Got It Live. We talk about bass lines. Oh, yeah. right. You know, Mike and Ennis, uh, what he wrote there. That Zach nice. Wilde. Yeah. yeah it's a nice, nice guy, too. Nice guy. Super young. Yeah. Nice bananas. Mike Ennis yeah. likes bananas. Loves bananas. <laughs> Speaking of Mike Inez, I'm here with another bassist, Johnny Chow, Masuda Chow is here. Restaurant, come on by, go see the, music, the magician when he's here in town. Yeah. But it's also bassist of Stone Sour, who opened up for Ozzy. Mike Inez was an Ozzy Osbourne. They also covered, Stone Sour covered, uh, We Die Young on one of the cover records. Awesome. And just Alice in Chains to me, I got Metallica and Alice in Chains when I wanted to. It's like Black Album, Ride the Light, you know? You like Alice in Chains? You met Chains. Jerry and Sean, the guys? Oh, oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of people knock Alice in Chains because, oh, well, once Lane, Lane left, you know, it was done. And, you know, people are like, oh, he sounds just like him. And it's not that he sounds. He does have a similar, William, he does have a similar, similar vocal range. But everybody forgets Jerry Cantrell sang a shit ton of that band. His backing vocals are almost. All about the song and a lot of those songs. Yeah. So that's why there's such a similarity there. Right. I think they really, really were able to nail down, not losing that spirit of Lane Stanley's kind of tone and range. So I think they're an awesome band. Just getting ready for this morning, uh, you know, waking up and getting stoked for this interview. And thank you so much for joining. I played your cover of EPs that you played with Stone Sour. That's the Meanwhile on Burbank, but then straight out of Burbank. Um, and we die young started my little kind of get stoked moment. And I just, I'll be honest, I've only listened to your cover once until right. today. And I was blasting that from my host speaker, bro. That song is so lively, and it's just, I feel like I'm literally in the studio hearing you guys play that shit. That's awesome. And it, and it kept the way, it kept it going through Creeping Death and, yeah, yeah. and uh, heading out to the highway. It's Juice oh, Priest, yeah, dude. That, was, that, was that to me is the ultimate road song. And, you know, going to drive to a show or whatever. So, right. yeah, that's awesome. So sick. But, you know, when it comes to mind, when I think of Burbank, I, bet, I used to live in L.A. Um, I've been in Burbank once. In fact, I was in the uh, – oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so I've been in the Playboy building. Um, I was going to say a story for another time. I know my mother's watching, but, hey, <laughs> I could explain. I was in the Playboy building because there's uh, – <laughs> yeah, and, uh, on Playboy TV, there's like a Desperate Housewives kind of show, and it's like uh, Desperate Playboy Bunnies or something, ah, that's and um, I was up in the Encino Hills, I was cast as a bartender, it was cool for, for Playboy TV, nice. and uh, when I think of Encino Hills, I think of one of my personal all-time favorite drummers, is Dave Grohl, oh, yeah. uh, Dave Grohl was up there, I was looking for him, you know, up there, but beautiful home and everything, and uh, dude, that's... Uh, I bartended at a show for that. So that's awesome. Meanwhile, Burbank, yep. I was just rewinding back this morning about that. It's kind of funny. But my dad, I had one question for you. Just real quick. Your three top favorite, your top three bass players of all time. That's from my dad, Kevin J. Lavello. I would say, so my opinion is, um, listen to John Paul Jones, man. Just here. And position he is, and how he just flows. And he creates rhythms with, you know, with bottom that are just so amazing and on the back beat, just so groovy. Um, so JPJ, I'm sure. Dude, when the levy breaks, uh, what are some bass songs that stand out to you from Led Zeppelin? I mean, you know, all of them. All of them yeah. You know what I mean? You can't yeah. pick one out yeah, because right. they're so awesome. Man. And when he wasn't playing, he was playing keys too. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, just like, no quarter. An amazing musician, and um, you know, it's incredible. Man. And that's from that classic era. And then you take somebody like Swire from uh, Yes, man, his aggressive playing is just, just he just had personality in his fingertips. The way he played, the way he attacked that bass, and you know, when, you know, our neighbor to the north, Betty Lee. You know what I mean? Betty Lee and Swire, I feel were. Kind of similar in their approach, really great approach to the bass. The attack on it. It's a great 
impressive feel, impressive tone. A lot of that comes from your fingertips. When I learned drums, my drumming teacher, he was, uh, te- he was a diehard Yes fan. And I didn't ask him then, but I want to ask you now. I know nothing of the band Yes. Um, when, I th- when I think of the band Yes, I think of Owner of a Lonely Heart from Grand Theft Auto by City. You don't drive and around. That wasn't even, that, that, was, that was like the 80s. That was like 80s. Yes, so an 80s song. Right. I met Taylor Hopkins as a, as a, as a front end manager at Wolfgang Puck at Hotel Bel Air. I oh, wow. Wolfgang Puck right there in the middle of the Forbes Five Star Five Nine Hotel. I met a lot of my favorite rockers, Monkey from Corn, Marilyn Manson, yep. Jim Carrey, uh, and so on. Ken Reeves, my boy. Nice. One of the guys I met was Taylor Hawkins, and he was getting coffee in the morning for his wife, and I had like 15, 20 minutes just to no one's around shooting the shit with Taylor Hawkins. Yeah. And he had a yes hat on. Oh, nice. So I didn't ask him then either, but I'm curious. What was the Yes record, the 70s, 1970s Yes record that maybe I could learn more about your To be honest, man, I, I, I can't even tell you. Yeah. Uh, but any of the 70s stuff? Any of the 70s stuff. Anything yeah. from the 80s on with a lot of those bands. Like they, a lot of bands that were from the 70s and crossing over into the 80s lost it for me in the 80s. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because right. they had those. those Songs, Genesis, uh, yeah, uh, all that. Right. Like, I don't know. The eighties were weird. Yeah. Rock and roll the eighties are more about like you know, the attitude, the, well, the image, well, the, the, the new wave era and stuff like that coming into for me. You know what I mean? That's when, like, the eighties for me, that's my whole like where I would go with music. Seventies classic rock stuff, for sure, yeah. sure, man. But the, the new wave that led into the punk rock, early. Punk um, you know, just, I don't know, I think a lot of those classic rock bands was the hit the 80s kind of got a little cheesy. Yeah. It's because it was, it was yeah. what it was, you know what I mean? Right. You know, right. It's just like, got some fun numbers on there, like fun big choruses that are, are you know, for bars. But I tell you, we're here at Masuda Chow's at the restaurant and I like, I love it when bar restaurants have jukeboxes. I could come and put on some good shit finally, you know, <laughs> well, you, you come in here and man, I walked in here. And you had Living Dead Girl by Rob Zombie off one of my all time favorite records. Nice. I was really did a lot of 1998. Um, that's my Halloween record. You know, that's awesome. And uh, you got any costume ideas for this year? You, um, you know, last year I just did a regular painted face skeleton. Yeah. Um, got I don't, you know, it's so crazy. It's like this whole it virus, is. you know, I mean, we usually plan a big, huge Halloween party for the camera costume contest, all sorts of stuff. But, I'm not too sure what we're doing this year, so I don't know if I'm going to be dressed up this year. Okay. Just I know like it's an off year for everyone yeah, in that respect. Here. In the restaurant business. And, you know, Just one last question I have for you. What's been your proudest moment in being in Stone Sour, a globe-traveling band? Of course, it's on hiatus right now. Uh, Corey Taylor, he's got the CMFT, which have you checked that record I out? Have. I have. You like it? There's some songs on there I did, some yeah. songs I'm, I'm not so hot on, but that's okay. That's okay. That's, he's got a massive fan base that loves that, yeah. that, that album. And, and I think it's great that he's able to get that out and do himself, where it's just like, you know, a lot of times when we're doing songs, we're writing songs, we demo the songs, we'll be like, all right, out of these like 25 songs, what songs do we take to the studio? And, you know, it's a very democratic situation in Stone's album. Everybody writes, everybody gets credit for it. Um, and it's, it's really cool. You know, sometimes a song that I think is awesome might get voted out, but then sometimes a song or it thinks is awesome might get voted out. Yeah. You know I mean? So I think he's used a few of those songs for his own thing. Gotcha. Which is good because that's, that's, that's CT, really, at his best. That's him. CT, man. Yeah. I really connect with him. Um, there's been some videos that he's posted on YouTube. He's gone through depression and anxiety. Of course, and, and we all have now. Yeah. Like, to, to be honest, you know, Josh has just come out and talked about it. He missed that totally Canadian one with uh, Hailstorm. Um, because he had to step away to the house and left, left himself. Yeah. We were all supportive of that. Man. Right. Our friend Jonah Nimoy and uh, RJ Monkilo came out and split up the tour. Um, Jonah actually played this again. Um, we all split it. Jonah's great too. He's actually the grandson of Leonard Nimoy. His father. I'm sorry, Jonah Nimoy. Nimoy, okay. Yeah. Leonard Nimoy was his grandfather. 
Joan is like this awesome like sketch artist. And yeah, amazing guitarist. Just a great dude. RJ is just like badass country like guitarist that played on like right Paisley albums and stuff like that. He's just badass. Um, so both of them were friends. We all met them through uh, Tooch, Christian Martucci, uh, the guitarist for Sing Song. So Tooch called them up and was able to get them to come out and record the song. Like literally, the songs that showed up were a matter of like 24 hours. You got to because we were, we were coming from doing the cruise yeah. to starting our tour. And uh, yeah, so props to those guys. Is there moments or memory that you, you've taken thus far in your journey with Stone Sour that stands out? I mean, the fact that you're, you guys are buddies and bros and you're able to bullshit on stage, yep. um, that's that's hard to come by. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I would say like the proudest moment for me with Stone Sour, pr- proudest moment in my musical career, honestly, was when my mom and dad got to see me for the first time. That was at the Rapids Theater. They had never seen me play all the like. With, uh, that was, was with Papa Roach. Papa Roach? Yeah, oh, okay. we were, it was, Stone Sour and Papa Roach were doing a flip-flop on uh, headlining days. It's the opener. I think the opener is really fun. Um, so that's the Papa Roach. Rapids Theater and Rapids Falls. Theater, yeah. And my mom and dad, <clears throat> my whole family for that matter, I talked to the guy at the Rapids and with our tour manager, I was able to secure like, a few uh, tables in the balcony. That was the first time they ever saw me play, you know. All my years of playing painters halls, different shitty bars and stuff like that, they never saw me play. So it was really cool for them to see me play that night, in that atmosphere in front of like 2,500 people. And you know, according to this big YouTube production, pointed out got my family was up there. So that was really cool. That was awesome. It's awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. I can't even imagine. That's that's so cool, um, dude. So I got something for you. You know, and uh, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. I, I asked no one. Yeah, I asked no one. I asked someone. Uh, you got some cool decorations here at the restaurant. I thought you could use my boy. Oh, yeah. Man. You know, Jack Skellington. Jack Skellington. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, you hold this. Oh, sweet. <laughs> That's awesome, man. So I'm going to be Jack Skellington for Halloween. Oh, you are. My nice. girlfriend's going to be uh, Sally. So awesome. Here you go, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Yeah. We've, but, had, we've had a little Jack Skeleton. I don't know if you noticed. We have him tucked up in the corner. Oh, really? It's like a little hidden gem. Oh, okay. Thing, so. I'm going to have to find him. Yeah. We'll put this bad boy up for sure, man. But awesome. Dude, we had a great dinner here the other day. We're going to come you. back. Um, keep rocking, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Faith. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you're watching right now, I think I'm. Shoot, subscribe, or check out the other videos. You know, subscribe, whatever. I love subscribe. But uh, stay happy, stay healthy, stay hungry, stay heavy. On Saturday, it's going to be 20th anniversary of Lincoln Park Tiger Theory record. Oh, wow. It's 20, 20 years, man. It's also, nice. yep. And uh, we're going to talk about that. Just, just me and my sister Hannah. My sister Hannah turns 25. Nice. So a little happy birthday, Hannah. Happy birthday, Hannah. <laughs> But, brother, thanks again. Thank you. Stay safe. Thanks, guys. Peace out, guys. Later. Awesome. Cool, man.